Okay. Um, so do you pray? Yes. Not very much anymore, no. Yes. Uh, yeah, I did pray uh, when my uh, mom passed away. I do pray. Um, not as much as I should. I know when I was younger, I would you know, try and do it before bed. Well, we all have different definitions of prayer, and I definitely pray. Yeah, I, I pray usually when I wake up, when I go to sleep, or when I'm eating. That's because I was, I was born in the church, and that's what they told us to do, so it's just, I became accustomed to it, so yeah, I just pray. Alright, okay, so you said faith-based, do you think prayer changes anything? I think it changes how you feel inside, okay. like the way like some people meditate, I guess, and in a way for Mom Cadley, like meditating is our prayer basically, uh -huh. and I guess I feel a lot better after I go to something like confession and pray about something I've done, or I feel a lot better morally and spiritually. Okay. Just to, to feel better about myself, I know that uh, just God, he's, you know, almighty being, he's listening all the time, and you know, speaking to someone that isn't there or you know, to someone that's not an actual person. I don't know, it does something like, hey, he's listening, even though it may not feel like it, I know he is. Oh, I don't know. Um, I don't know, I feel like a lot of people think that like there's some like divine power that's like way out there above them somewhere. And I just, I just don't feel like that's true. I feel like like intuition and that sort of connection to the universe that everybody has comes from within inside your own like heart, within yourself. And I think that connection to like everything else is what like the greater power actually is. It's like what resides within you is that thing that people call God. So we turn back to the, the series, Infinite and Intimate. This infinite God who is the author of creation, the creator and sustainer of all things, is also this intimate God who, who knows us by name, who knows us by identity, who formed us in our mother's womb. And today we turn our heart back towards the, con, or the concept or the understanding of what it means to be people of prayer. What does it mean to listen? in our culture. We do not listen well. Turn on any mainline news channel and just watch how well they listen, right? There is no listening in our culture. We are bombarded by noise constantly, and I believe that the single greatest transformational power in the life of a Christian is the capacity and discipline of being able to speak to God and then listen and ponder and wait for him to reply. The life of prayer in the Christian faith is vital for any kind of witness to God. So what we want to do today is kind of dial in and deal with what Jesus would say on it. But listening's not as easy as we uh, we make it. There's a lot of distractions. But let's not give ourselves too quick of a pass because I remember when I was little, and apparently I have ADD, but um, when I was little I was even better at not listening. But I remember growing up in Colorado, we'd be out playing and like, like, we would leave at lunch and then come back at dinner. I mean, it was awesome. And we'd go out and play in the neighborhood. And in the Grand Valley, when the, um, when the sun would set, get behind the mountains, all the lighting would kind of change. Shadows get long. And, um, and my mom, I, we were like the Von Trapp kids, I guess, um, from Sound of Music. My mom would whistle, and you'd be like, whoa, I have to go, and you just bolt, because mom whistled, right? Anybody else have a whistling parent who called them home? Yeah, we did. All right, so we're just basically human puppies, and um, that's okay. But when I was young, I, I, would, I would literally, I would be headlong into it, and I can't imitate my mom's whistle. I was never given that gift. So, um, but it would be this, like, wee wee kind of sound. I know, it's awesome. And, um, and I would literally, that sound would catch me. I would hear it. And I would respond because to not come home when mom whistled was, was super bad. And I would often get tanned for that. So I, when mom whistled, I could be very busy. But when she made that noise, I was like, well, fellas, it's been good. And I would head home. I knew I was being called. I knew the sound. When she made that whistling sound, I was on, I mean, I was just on a run. Why? Because I knew it. I knew it. We have an instinctual capacity to listen well to intimate voices when they call to us. Let's check this scripture out. It's a small scripture right out of John. It's John 10, 3. And it says this. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice, and they won't listen to another voice. My sheep know my voice, and they won't listen to another voice. 
I think, and I would like to propose to you, that in our culture, we have prayer completely messed up and wrong. I mean, when you're watching those people and they're talking, that last guy's like, you know, I believe God's inside of you, and, and he's kind of talking about how, you know, he, he's God, basically, which is very disappointing. And, um, and you see them kind of saying, you know, I, I believe God's right here, and I'm like, oh, you're so close to the truth. Sounds almost right, because we as Christians believe that when Christ redeems us, his Holy Spirit fills our lives, and we begin to live this kind of nuanced, wonderful, joyful Christian life empowered by the Spirit. And so the Spirit of God is inside of us. But what we need to know is that in our culture, we don't prize listening and prayer the way we should. And we need to look at it and understand that there are certain things that just aren't prayer. And we need to quit, quit pretending they are. I've heard people give some of the craziest things um, on, on prayer, how they pray. So they meditate, which for me always turns into a season where I'm making lists and trying to work out what's wrong. They're like, I go for a run and clear my head. Clearing your head isn't prayer. Yoga, though beneficial to your hamstrings, is not prayer, right? We have all these things we do that make us feel better, but is it prayer? And what would Scripture say about prayer, and why do we need to look at this text and understand that this, if we are to know Jesus' voice, there is but one way that we can do that, and it's through the life of prayer. It's through the life of prayer where we are speaking to God and listening to God. So the question comes, why should I pray? And the answer comes equally simple. The answer is um, to have God begin to reform and um, change the desires of my heart because our desires are typically bent towards ourselves. We have something we want. One of the reasons we should be people in prayer is because we want God to reform or change or transform our hearts towards him, to literally have God form the desires of our heart because I know you, like me, have desires that have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. They're neither good nor bad, but they have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. On the way to church, my son Josh and I were driving, and he said, if the Broncos lose to the 0-7 Chargers, or Chargers, well, that was Chargers anyways, to the Giants today, um, I will never watch them again this season. I'm like, I'm holding you to it. He's like, no, wait, I didn't mean that, right? He has this passion. We have this love for the Denver Broncos, and, and we get into it, and you get so crazy about it, and I'm willing to sever friendships and family ties over this stuff, and I'm so so passionate. But what does it matter? In the end, I think Lions fans are going to be in heaven too. Why are we so passionate about, well, blessed are the poor. Um, oh, not fair. Uh, roughing the Lions. Okay. All right. So, uh, sorry. Yeah, I know. I know. I, I, it'll be empty next week. All right. <laughs> Okay, so we're having God reform the desires of our hearts so we don't cave immediately to our quick desires. We have these quick firing desires and God wants us to do something different. So why should we pray to have God form the desires of our heart? What does that look like? What does that look like for you and I? Why should I pray? Because spiritual discipline is part of prayer. And spiritual discipline does to the heart and the soul what physical, hard physical training does to the body. Have you ever seen someone who is a little doughy and a little out of shape and they decide to get to it and they go to one of those like crazy um, like workout, what are they called? Boot camp. Yeah, things I'm not going to. All right, I'll go to donut camp. Um, but, But they go to boot camp and in like three months you look at them and you're like, my goodness. What happened to you? They look different. Their physical discipline transforms their exterior, and it not only looks different, but it's now equipped and built to respond. They can move. They they get cat-like. They have a physical change that comes from a physical discipline. Spiritual discipline opens our ears and our eyes to begin to see this the world the way God sees it and love it the way God loves it. It's a spiritual discipline, and the reason I know it's a spiritual discipline is because when I pray, it puts me in a place where I begin to focus on God, and we see that we are truly opposed in this world by the devil. Because when you bow your head to pray, have you ever had this? You like bow your head, and you're like, I'm going to have a time of prayer. 
close your eyes, and what comes hopping through? Like a zebra. Doot, doot, doot. And you're like, oh, oh, I'm not thinking about zebras, I'm praying. And then a penguin rides by wearing a sombrero on the zebra, and you're like, ah, I can't quit the distractions. I can't quit thinking about this. And then you're like, you just sit there and think. Start thinking about the Broncos. Start thinking about the Lions. Start thinking about your car. Oh, my goodness, did I make the payment? Oh, my word, what are we doing tomorrow? I don't know if we got a babysitter this weekend at all. By the end of your prayer time, you have a list this long about things you need to do, and you never talked to God once because we don't have the spiritual discipline to push the distractions and the tyranny of the urgent aside and say, no, this is my time to form within me an ear that hears the voice of God. It gives us, this spiritual discipline gives us the ability to begin to hear God and to understand what God's desires are for us. We have to be people who live into the spiritual discipline of becoming spiritually fit. It's not easy. It's a discipline. It's fighting off the distractions and not being held to the tyranny of the urgent and all those things come flooding in when we try to quiet down and pray. We have a hard time doing that. But why we pray is because it allows us to be in a place where we begin to see things from God's perspective. And that's critical for the Christian. My, per- my perspective is generally limited, right? The way I see myself is different than what's actually there. The way God sees things, God sees all. Isn't it nice to know that, that God is above our problems. He's not bound by them. And when we pray and we get close to God, we begin to see things differently and we lose our own broken, kind of self-centered sense of identity. The best way to explain how it is when you, when you realize how self-centered you are is, um, even in prayer, is, is to see how you misperceive yourself. Like, we can look at God and realize he's over everything. And then we think, but like that guy, you know, I've got a good handle on life. I think I'm doing okay, but it's a raging garbage fire, really. We're trying to maintain a crazy balance, but we have no spiritual discipline. And we lose our identity in Christ for a false identity in this world. And we think it looks good. When we were um, on vacation, Erica and I one night went to this place, and, and we made a deal. She would sing karaoke if I would. And I was like, Done! I'll sing, and I got up there. She sang, people wept. It was awesome. She sang Jewel, and then I get up there. It's like, I'm from the 80s. Time for a little Bon Jovi. And so I get up there, Bad Medicine, great song, not a good video. Don't watch it. And um, somebody laughed because they know. Um, but but when uh, I get up there, I'm like, all right, you know, it's either do it or don't. And I, I got going, and I thought at the time, I'm like, you sir are awesome. Like, I was super confident. I went for the high notes. I was like, ah, yeah, I reached. And at one point, there's an, a solo for the guitar, put the mic back down, played an air guitar solo, threw a fake guitar over my back, and went back to the, I didn't know Erica was recording it, okay? And she's like, do you want to see? I'm like, yeah. Well, I mean, seriously, this is awesome. Whole new career. And, and I was like, is there someone throwing cats in a fan? It was awful. I thought it was awesome, and it was horrendous, and I was like, we have to leave Vermont, babe. I know they're hippies and smoking crazy things, but we can't be here. Uh, uh, oh, that's what I sound like? You've known me 18 years, and di- these are things you tell people, right? Like, I lost my mind, because I thought it was awesome. As Christians, we often think, I'm good. My desires are like God's. No, quite honestly, your desires and my desires are a lot like my vocal ability. It's a little rough at best, and our desires don't often match God's. Well, another reason we should pray is so that we learn to hear the voice of God. Instead of hearing us all the time, we begin to hear the voice of God. And if we don't know the voice of God, it's not his fault. It's on us. He speaks through his word all the time, and we don't read it. He speaks to people who sit in quiet, spiritual, disciplined prayer and speak to God, then listen to God. God does speak, but the reality is often we don't see much transformation in our life in what God wants to do because we don't ever listen for his voice. So we need to do, as Jesus said, his sheep know his voice. We need to be people who know the voice of our shepherd. And when he calls us, we have to obey. And one of the great ways I know when God's speaking is when I have the, but I don't want to reaction. 
Have you ever had that where God puts something on your heart and you're like, no, I don't want to. I don't have a desire to do that. I have a number of them that went on in my life when I was younger. One of the best examples is this building. I wanted our church to look at the Sly Building across from Cityside because I thought it looked rustic and awesome. Yes, I like Joanna Gaines. So I was like, okay, this is good. I like this. And the realtor said, no, we should come look at this at the old DNW. I'm like, by Dollar General? Ew. No, this, there's nothing there. Why? Ugh. And I walked in, and I walk in, and Christopher, who was drumming, was with me. He walks in, he goes, Oh, yeah, and he sees this. It was just a wide open space. It looks like something out of a scary movie when we first got it. And I walked in, I was like, oh, no, this is home. I don't want this. I don't, yuck, I don't want it. What? Oh, God, why? And God literally put on my heart, trust me, trust me, trust me. See it the way I do. And so I turned to someone who could see it the way maybe God did. And I said, do you, do you think this would work? And I think this building is a great story of what happens when we listen to God. It sat empty for 10 years. And now the church gathers here. And it's a life-giving community in Zealand. It used to be vacant. And God's called it together. I think our lives should replicate that. But we often find ourselves when we learn God's voice going, but I don't want to. Because it's scary, because we find out God's desires for this world have nothing to do with our pride or self-promotion. They have only to do with the glory of Jesus Christ and how we give witness to him in this world. God wants to reveal Jesus through our lives, and the only way I've ever seen that happen is by people who spend time learning the voice of the one they call their shepherd, their savior, and their Lord. For us, we have to wrestle with the fact, do we know his voice? And if we don't, how are we going to remedy that? So to answer that, we'll ask the question, how do I pray? How should I pray? Thankfully, the Lord Jesus Christ gives us a lot of good examples of prayer. If Jesus Christ needed to leave ministry, go away and be alone on a mountaintop and pray, get away and remember the heart of God for these people, so do we. You've got to step back from the chaos of your life and spend time with the one who gives purpose to your life. We can't think we're better than Jesus. And Jesus often went away to a quiet place where he would pray and be in communion with his Father. Then he teaches his disciples how to pray. And I love this because we don't often look at this correctly. Anybody here ever heard of the term the Lord's Prayer? Yeah, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, what we often do with that is we we misuse it. We recite it, but it's like building a building but only framing it, not putting any actual boards around the walls or roof or anything, and we walk into just frame sticks and go, well, this is perfect. I'm going to just do this. This is home. Jesus built a frame for prayer, and what he wants us to do is build a life around that frame. Our Father who art in heaven. Let's just look there for a second. How nice is it to know that God's in heaven seeing all this and we're not God? That there is one who sees over the chaos and isn't rattled by it. Do you see how you can stop and just in the Lord's Prayer say, thank you God that you are in heaven and you are not bound to the tyranny that I am. You're over things. Can I see things? Can you give me the peace that you see things bigger than I do? Because I'm held by these little issues in my small life that keep me from living into the bigger opportunity of living in your life and in your power. Our Father who art in heaven. Isn't that a great way to think of that opening line? Instead of reciting it, begin to say it and speak out where God is and the power of it. And then it goes on to say, glory be to your name, hallowed be your name. Have you ever been in a doctor's office and a report is coming in, a diagnosis Have you ever been at a hospital when there's been a car accident and you sit there and you go, oh God, what if? What names do we have for God in those moments? moments? Isn't he our healer? Isn't he our comforter? Isn't Christ our peace? See, if you just say, hallowed be thy name, it doesn't mean anything. Start calling out to the one who knows you and to the one who you need. My kids can call me and if it's like, Dad, I'm like, yeah, not answering that. I think I'm leaving. Because I don't like that voice, that tone, that whiny thing that kind of ends in a question mark. No. 
I can't stand it. But you know what's awesome? God loves us and even listens to our whining sometimes. But the really cool thing is God knows when we scream. Because there is a couple of screams, especially like my daughter, like, like, Daddy, I'm like, here come the guns. I will, do, I will do anything, right? You just go to help. When your child calls you as a parent, you go running. Have you ever had that in the middle of the night? Your kid has a bad dream, and out of, like, happy dreamland, you hear a blood-curdling scream, and you're like, oh, and you jump up, and you're headed for their room to see what's in there. Because what? You're their protector, When did we quit calling God by the way he's revealed himself? He is our peace in the chaos. He is our hope in the brokenness. He is our healing in the the disunity of our own bodies and lives. He is the one who not only loves us, but he redeemed us. He is not only worth, worth having as a savior, he's worth living for in this life. He is the one we can give names to. Call out to God. You hallow his name by giving him the, the honest relational interaction of a child to a parent. Call out to God based on who he's told you he is. The next thing is this. Your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. That is such a noble thought, isn't it? Like when you say that as a Christian, don't you feel good? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Like we did anything. What if we said this? God, today take my life at the shop, at the office, at the house, at the church, at wherever, and, and in some way use my life that your kingdom would come, that your kingdom would come into a dark place and into the darkness, as Justin read earlier, a bright light would shine. How much more realistic and tangible is that? What if we invited God to let his kingdom come through our lives instead of us sitting back and watching it like a movie? God's inviting us to build a prayer life around this structure that does what? It reveals his kingdom to a world that doesn't understand it. Because according to what I saw in that video and the interviews I was a part of in downtown Grand Rapids, there's a lot of spirituality. There are very few people who are Christians and believe that Jesus Christ is exactly who he said he is in Scripture. So we have to understand for us, when we invite God for his kingdom to come and his will to be done, it is saying, may your kingdom come, and this is the kind of cool pivot, and your will be done on earth where I am as it is in heaven. So what does he have to do for his will to come? His will has to come and supersede mine because I am a strong-willed person. I am somebody who gets set in my ways and wants to do it a certain way. And God reforms the desires of our heart. Forgive us our sins or give us this day our daily bread. How many of us are hedging our bets for tomorrow? When Jesus Christ taught us a model of prayer that says take care of today, tomorrow has enough worries of its own. We hedge our bets, we look to retire well, and none of it's guaranteed. And Jesus Christ, I believe, is is calling us in this daily bread understanding, not just to worry about dinner, but to worry about what's in front of us presently. Be present to your life now, not tomorrow. Be present now. If you will be present now and begin to develop a prayer life today, tomorrow will come easier. We have to be present in our daily lives. What if we invited God to be present every day, every moment to the lives we live so that his glory could be revealed? And we quit living for tomorrow, which in the end never really gets here. God's goal for you is not Florida, a condo, and going to bed at 7, up at 4 a.m., and dinner by 3. That's not it. We're not hedging for tomorrow. We are living for today because this is what we have right here. Who knows what could happen and end every life in this room like that. It's not guaranteed that we'll make it out of here. It is guaranteed we have this moment. And why don't we focus on this moment and trust that God will provide right here, right now, today, all that we need. He is our faithful provider. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. I will say this to you, that is the hardest thing for me to forgive things that are offenses and hurts, but the reality is if we don't forgive, it's awful hard to ask forgiveness. Forgive as freely as you were forgiven and live in the buoyant, winsome goodness of a life that it not only exhibits forgiveness but receives it. So invite God to forgive you of what you are bound to. Jesus Christ died that your sin 
would hold you no longer. Your past doesn't own you. He does. And he's called you into a future. The next thing is, uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Do we not need somebody to protect us from ourselves? Does anybody else ever feel that way? Like there are so many voices in that world. The multi-billion dollar industry of marketing tells us what our desires are constantly. It tells us and it tempts us and it lures us in with all the beauty of what's offered and none of the fulfillment of who Christ is. And we ask, God, please protect me. Please protect me. It's, it's amazing to me, especially, and I think children are the best example, but if my, my youngest son, Ethan, if he gets nervous, I mean, he doesn't like get as far away from me as possible. He snuggles real up close. He's like, we're good, right? And I'm like, we're good, buddy. It's fine. Yeah, I know. These streets look tough. You know, he gets really nervous. I'm like, dude, we're in downtown Holland. It's fine, you know? But, he's, but he'll get nervous, and he'll kind of snuggle up close. That's the kind of imagery Jesus is giving us in prayer. Snuggle up close and say, could you please protect me from the evil one? I'm weak. I'm not real good at this life thing. Could you help? Kids get to ask their parents that. Why can't we be intimate enough with God to say, please, Deliver me from temptation. I'm so tired of failing. Keep me from evil. You're my dad. You love me. And lean into that relationship. Finally, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the honor and the glory forever. That is just a great way to end a prayer being reminded that God has it all. It's all his and we are called heirs to participate in his kingdom, which is here and fully coming if the church would wake up learn the voice of their heavenly father and obey when their hearts are prompted. What we have to do in all of this is understand that we should be praying as Jesus taught, not reciting what we think Jesus wants. Do we have any husbands in here today? Yeah, a few of us out there. What if you walked home tomorrow and you're like, good evening, honey, you look lovely. I like what you've done with your hair. Hello. Hello. You'd be like, whoa. Your wife would be like, what did you do? <laughs> right? <laughs> Nothing. No, I didn't do anything. Well, you still look lovely. Things are well with us. I appreciate our life. Thank you. <laughs> right? And then, not only did you do that, the next day you come home. Good evening. You look lovely. It's nice to see you. I appreciate our life. Awkward bow. She'd be like, what is going on? Just talk to me. You are a doorknob. This is not a relationship. You would be like that. And we will sit back as Christians be like, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and pretend that reciting something to God is a prayer life. That's a farce. Jesus gave us the structure on which to build a prayer life. Quit reciting things that Jesus didn't intend for us to say, wrote, but to have a conversation with. Because there's a difference when you walk in the house and you're like, hey, and everybody's like, hi, you know, and there's this interactive thing. There's no awkward bowing. I don't know where the bow came from. It didn't happen in first service. But I'm um, like, I know, it's weird. Um, but you, you have this, this kind of human connectiveness. Jesus Christ was a human. He was fully human so that he would know us and he could connect with us. Talk to him. Quit reciting things to him and tell him about your life. Pray to him. Look how Jesus prayed and taught his disciples to pray. That's how we can get a model for it. The second thing is to know this. Look at how Jesus prayed. In John chapter 17, Jesus prayed for you. You, specifically you. He prays for, it's a high priestly prayer. He prays for himself. He prays for the disciples. And then he says, my prayer is not for them alone. Speaking of the disciples, I pray also for those who believe in me through their message. That's us that all of them may be one. Father, just as you and I are one and I am in you, may they be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I and them, you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. Jesus is saying, get close to me, hear my voice. Jesus prayed that you would have ability and freedom to come to him and pray and talk as a child would to their parent, to come and have conversation. But Jesus also does good in Luke chapter 18 to remind us that the high-minded religious prayers 
of people who think they have it together, we might not want to pray those because there is a section in Luke 18 where Jesus tells a story of a Pharisee, religious elite, knows scripture, stands up and prays a prayer in the temple that says, God, I thank you that you have made me righteous and discerning and you have not let me be a wicked man such as that. And next to him, the guy he pointed to is a tax collector, the lowest of the low, who is beating his chest and saying, oh God, forgive a sinner like me. Which one do you think Jesus liked? Jesus doesn't need our pious behavior. He wants our hearts. And until we say, come Lord Jesus and have what is yours, we will never get out of our own way. We'll be pious and think we have it together and we will never know the voice of God. We will only hear our own self-righteous proclamations that aren't true. So what we have to do is ask three questions and apply this. First of all, do you pray? If you don't, I invite you to start praying in little ways, in big ways, over everything. I don't think anything's wrong with praying for your food. I don't think anything's wrong with going to bed and praying. I don't think anything's wrong with prayer in general. I do think that your prayer should feel more like a conversation with God and you can build it around the structure of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus gave us. Talk with him. Do you pray? If not, this is my invitation to you. Don't forsake the one and greatest gift of a conversation with your Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit because that alone can begin to transform you. That alone can give you the life you need in Christ. Next thing, make time and stay in contact. This is so important. We go weeks without praying until, like, you know, you hit somebody's, you know, you get in a car accident, and you're like, oh, God, please help me not be in trouble, right? That's when we pray. We pray when we have a need. What if God has a need for us? What if God wants us to be in participation with him, and by staying in contact, we see this world the way he does. We love this world the way he does, and we're not bowing to the tyranny of the urgent. We're in contact with the one who's playing a long game. And he is redeeming his sons and daughters from darkness into light. And he's using your prayer life and my prayer life to stay in contact to know how he feels about this world. It's really easy to get distracted unless we stay in contact and remember who our father is and what his heart is for this world. Third and final thing is this. There's an importance to knowing his voice that can only be found in the spiritual discipline of listening. I invite you this week to shut it all down. Take these horrendous leashes, these tethers to the rest of the world, turn them off, throw them on a table, and walk away. And go spend time without distraction and learn his voice. Ask him, will you speak to me? You think, can we just ask God that? If Ethan came up on the stage and said, Dad, will you talk to me? Would I be like, little kid, no, I'm not going to talk to you. Would he do, would I, I wouldn't. I'd be like, hey, buddy, I'm preaching. You should probably go. But um, I would talk to him. I would turn and respond to my son. I love him. Why don't we think we can say, God, I don't know your voice. Will you talk to me? Sit with his word. Open it up and begin to know the voice of God. And I guarantee I will get the joy of watching and listening you say, but I don't want to, God, because he will speak. And he will transform your life for his glory in this world. The question is, Will you participate? Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to know you as our Father and to know you um, as the one who loves us. But God, we often have forgotten our part in the family, that we are supposed to be in conversation, that we are supposed to listen, that we are supposed to speak. So God, would you open our mouths to share with you all that's breaking us, all that concerns us, and all that weighs us down. And then, Lord, will you quiet us so that we can sit and listen for that voice that speaks purpose, light, life, and order over the chaos of who we are. Come, Lord Jesus Christ. Your church desires to hear the words of their Savior, the words of their Father, through the power of the Spirit, for the glory of the one and only, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I said it when I started, and I mean it with all my heart. I think this could be the single most transformative teaching we've done if you would pray. If you would begin to pray. If the church would go and start listening to the voice of God and start obeying what he calls you to do. It is not easy, but it is our opportunity. It's not a task. It's our opportunity to hear from the high king of heaven. The creator and sustainer of all things speaks 
and has invited you to listen. He's invited you to bring what hurts you, what's broken you, so that he can redeem what is lost and call you forward into a future which, if we would listen, is inexplicably bright with his purposes. It's not easy to create the spiritual discipline of listening, but it is worth it. And I would invite you to go from this place and really make work of spending some time in conversation with him who loved you from the very foundations of this world. As you go, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is time for the church to leave the building. You are dismissed. <laughs>